Hello and welcome everybody. In chapter two, we're going to be talking about data acquisition. So this includes all things related to the acquisition of data, including types of data, uh, where you can find specific data sets, and the kind of issues that you can encounter when working with data after you've acquired it. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about the various types and sources of data that you can use for analysis and explain their characteristics. We're going to describe the essential features of transactional and informational systems, explain the uses of spreadsheets, flat files, and databases for data storage, and discuss data collection techniques. To that end, we're first going to talk about data provisioning. So when people are assigned data or given data versus when people are looking for their own data. We're also then going to talk about different types of data, whether it's structured or unstructured, and some of the details of uh, the specifics of data once you're looking at it. We'll discuss different data sources, so transactional and informational sources and other possible data sources. Then we'll talk about data gathering, so the process of sampling, calibrating and scaling, continuous monitoring, feedback mechanisms, and intelligent control agents. So what is data provisioning? Well, if you're not looking for your own data, you will be provided data to you by your organization or otherwise. So um, you may be given the actual data in a file format, or you may just be given access to the data. Uh, in this course, you will actually be accessing data online and downloading it for your own use. I will also be providing Excel files to you to use for your analyses as well. When data is provided to a user, it usually comes along with authorizations and security, whether that's on the file side or through um, obtaining data through an internet source or through the organization's server. Many data sets you're able to simply download with full permission uh, that are open source and available to the public. One such example is that of the census data that you'll be working with in your first assignment. One of the most important considerations when downloading or using a data set that you have access to is copying that data set before you actually use it. So when you're about to use a data set, my recommendation is to make a copy so that you have the original that is untouched, unmessed with, so that when you make changes or perform analysis, that you're not actually uh, manipulating that original set. This is the process of taking the data essentially offline for use. So we can talk about structured versus unstructured data. There are also a lot of underlying details when you're considering a specific data set. Um, in terms of whether that data is discrete, continuous, and so on. When you're looking at a structured data set, this will usually be um, organized data that's typically in rows and columns, so that which you'd either find in an Excel spreadsheet, a uh, text file, CSV file, or uh, in a database table. Typically, the fields or cells will be fixed width and the values will have specific data types, so whether that's a string or numeric, etc. Uh, and each cell will contain values related to a given input, such as sales, dollars, name, etc. So there usually will not be any missing data unless the field has allowed for null values. Um, when data is structured, it's great for analysis purposes because you know it's very easy to look at the data in this format. It's already perfectly clean. We can make some assumptions about the accuracy and consistency of that data. It's also easily understood by computers. So uh, very often when working with um, data from a database, you may have issues with encoding if you've kind of transferred that data from a different source that wasn't just a straight text file. And so when the computer is looking at it, it might not be able to interpret it. But once we've got it in a structured format, both we and the computer will be able to easily parse that data. And this data will usually include structured text, uh, numerical data, or dates. Again, things that are easily understood by both us and the computer. In contrast, we can talk about unstructured data. So this is data that is not very organized and can come in many different formats. So this can include uh, difficult to parse data, including audio, video, pictures, and graphics. It can also simply just include text that is not in a clean format that's easily read by us or a computer. So this is data really before it's been cleaned and set up for processing by some of the tools that we would use for our analysis. So the data can be of varying lengths, and so you've got, again, very unstructured uh, data that's not easy to read because of that inconsistency. 
Um, it might be in a free format and kind of unrelated to each other, such as comments and suggestions. So you can think about maybe uh, getting a transcript of a conversation, for example, or of a video call and trying to kind of compile it into a format that is more structured to be able to be processed. Um, when I was working on my dissertation, I was trying to compile a list of addresses of hotels in California. And so I had to scrape them manually from um, a website that I could, you know, kind of look at 20 on a page at a time. And so I, I sort of scraped each 20 set and tossed it into a text file and then use some Python script to actually uh, restructure that file so that it was easy for both me and the computer to then process it. So yeah, this is data that needs to be translated, if you will, so that a computer can actually read it and we can actually use it for analysis. Structured data will usually come in the format of a spreadsheet, uh, just a flat text file, or in the form of a database. So you will be provided with many uh, structured data sets in this course. Here's an example of a structured spreadsheet. So this is actually related to that global bike data set that you're going to be working with extensively throughout this course. Um, if we take a look, so again, uh, across the top, each column is what we refer to as a field. So we've got order number, year, month, day, etc. You can see that each field has a specific data type. So if you kind of scan across, you can see that revenue, for example, is in euros. Um, certain fields like division and uh, UOM have only two characters and they're both capitalized. So, and date, you know, is positioned, I believe, as month, day, year. We'll have to double check that once we kind of get further into the data set, whether it's uh, day, month, year, or month, day, year. But anyway, the point is that you can see that it's very structured. So each field has a specific data type and a specific format as well. When you are working with spreadsheets, one concern is that of data integrity. So this is kind of is dependent on, you know, where you get the data source. For many of our assignments, we can assume that the integrity of the data is intact because they're being provided to us by um, the authors of the textbook. Uh, these files are generally fairly small and easy to use. So, and that's kind of what you'll see when you're taking courses in analytics. Very often you'll be given very structured data that's easy to work with and that is small in size. And this is intentional because the focus is kind of more on the techniques and the tools that you're using rather than on the data cleaning. Uh, although I did mention, I think, in our first module that you know, you could kind of do a whole course on uh, data cleaning itself. Here is an example of a flat file. So CSV files, while you can open them with Excel, you can also view them simply by opening up Notepad or Notepad++ or other kinds of text file editors. They're treated the same way. Um, the difference is that, so CSV stands for comma separated values. So, you know, you see in the Excel version of this that you're viewing each field separated by the table boundaries for each field. Um, if you open it up in a text editor, you'll actually see each field separated without spaces using the comma as what we refer to as a delimiter. So um, you can also reorganize files to be separated by any delimiter. So you could use a semicolon, for example, but the CSV format is that separated by commas. So it just makes it very easy for the computer to process the file when it's in this format. Um, different applications, so Tableau and uh, MySQL, you know, for example, are able to read files like this very efficiently. The other thing to note is that if spaces are included in the field, you can see that those are also included in the um, comma separation here. So for example, 1300 Pennsylvania is actually still separated by that space. That space is actually counted as a character. So that is actually part of that field. Another form of structured data is that of the data stored in what's called a relational database. So if you've taken a database course, you have the understanding that essentially in a database, you have tables that are uh, committed to storing data usually to one or two types of entities or actors as we call them. So for example, we can have a table dedicated to a customer and a table dedicated to uh, an order construct. 
and we relate these two tables um, by indicating you know, for a particular customer, what's the minimum and maximum number of orders that can be related to that customer? And for an order, what is the minimum and maximum number of customers that can be rela related to that order? So this is a screenshot from Access. You can see that a customer can be related to many orders, so the infinity sign, and each order can only have one customer. Um, in the database theory, what you need to understand is that the primary key is the field that is chosen to uniquely identify a specific record in a table. So you can think of your student ID, for example, at the university. Uh, when you are stored in a student table, that is what is used to uniquely identify you. You know, it's not your phone number, it's not your name. You have a student ID that uniquely identifies you. A foreign key is going to be a primary key from another table that is used to link uh, the two tables together. So you can see in the order table, we actually have customer number. It doesn't have a key in front of it, but is used to connect the order to its corresponding singular customer. I've been using some of this terminology already, but just to follow up. So some additional database terminology, you have the database, then you have files uh, corresponding to each table. So for example, a customer file, the vendor file. Within each of those tables or files, you have records. So corresponding to individual customers or individual uh, vendors. And then within each record, you have a set of fields. So for example, each customer has a customer name and a customer address. Each vendor has a vendor name and a vendor address. But you can see overall that it is a very structured method of storing data. So when you're accessing data from a database, if you're pulling it, for example, using SQL for your analysis, that it's going to come out nice and clean because it's stored in a very specific structured way. There is an acronym used in database called CRUD. So to indicate the different types of interactions you can do with a database. So you can, for example, create a database or a database table. You can read from the database, so you can do data retrieval. You can update records or tables in the database, and you can also delete records or tables or the entire database. So CRUD is the way to kind of remember all the different types of transactions that you can do against the database. One consideration when talking about databases is that of data anomalies. So again, if you've had database uh, course, you will know that you can have update, insert, and deletion anomalies. So the goal of creating an entity relationship model um, using the guidelines outlined by Ted Codd is to avoid these types of anomalies. So to reduce data redundancy um, and make sure that, for example, when we want to update um, a person's first name, that when we do that, it only happens once. And so it makes sure that that person's name is updated everywhere it could possibly be involved in the database uh, and you don't have any update anomalies. Similarly, with an insertion anomaly, uh, we wanna make sure that we can insert a new record into a table uh, without it having to insert either additional information or you know, be dependent on something else. So if you think about it, if we had a table that had both doctor and patient specifics in it, we couldn't um, put in a new patient until they were actually assigned a doctor. And that might not be the way that we want to do it. If you consider you know, working at a hospital, maybe a patient comes in and isn't given a doctor right away. So we wanna prevent that insertion anomaly by making sure that the data is stored properly. Finally, we want to make sure that we don't encounter any deletion anomalies. So in that same case with the doctor and patient information stored in the same table, um, let's say we have a doctor retire. We wanna make sure that if we delete their information that we don't lose all of their patient information as well. And so there is a method, a process to go through to store data properly uh, to model it properly in a database to make sure that these anomalies don't occur. Um, and one of those methods, besides you know going in using a proper entity relationship model, if you can't do that, what you have to do is what's called normalization. So the process of using concepts from relational algebra to sort of t 
tease out each individual entity and make sure that you don't have um, kind of dependencies that you don't want in the table. That will help you eliminate any type of anomaly mentioned previously. Here we have some examples of unstructured data. So as I mentioned before, this can include media. So like images, videos, audios, uh, text can also be unstructured or uh, XML data, so tagged data as well. And it can be that a computer can understand it if you have, say, a script that's able to parse it, but most likely it's not understandable by a computer. So if you think about that CSV file, it's highly structured. The computer knows, okay, once I see a comma, I'm getting something new. And then I see another comma and I'm getting something new again. So with unstructured text, for example, you may have to convert it or parse it into a new form before that can happen. A couple of examples here, so you can think about, I think I mentioned um, you know, taking a recording of voice and changing it into text. So we do have some uh, speech to text converters that have varying degrees of success. I think the best way is honestly just to have a person go through it and kind of listen to what's going on and then type it out. There are services um, that actually you can find on the internet that will do this, I believe. So Scribe is one such transcription service. I believe it's S-C-R-B-I-E. I've actually used it to um, transcribe some data I had from an experiment. Um, there are also programs that can convert images into text so that it's understandable by a computer. And this is just something to consider when you are working with unstructured data that really it's, you know, it's going to be the computer or the application like Tableau that is doing the analysis. And so you want to make sure that the computer or application can understand it. Here's an example of how a computer will process unstructured text data. So if you take a look at this example, we have some um, XML that is tagged. So for example, you have a message opening tag and a message closing tag. The computer can parse this and go through and say, okay, I recognize this is the whole message, um, but you have to have specialized software in order to do that. So just as a side note, XML is not the same thing as HTML. So XML is a different type of uh, tagged language. HTML tags denote format and appearance, whereas XML tags denote the actual content. There are packages that will process other types of unstructured data, for example, natural language processors. Um, so some packages in Python, like the NLTK, can translate um, language that it hears, and uh, it can translate it into commands that it can actually understand. This is a very difficult process and is not that well defined as of yet, but it's an area in which a lot of research is being done. We've also made some strides in image recognition. So translating pictures and information the computer can understand. We can find different markers on people's faces that we can then turn into markers that the computer can use to recognize people's faces. So one example is the Facebook facial recognition app. And then we also have strides in artificial intelligence, although this is an area that still needs quite a lot of work. It's difficult for computers to learn, although when you program a computer to be able to do a specific task, it can do it very well. There are what are called transactional systems or online transaction processing, aka OLTP, that can be used to uh, support high volume business transactions. So um, these usually use a three-tiered system architecture where you have what the user sees, so the presentation tier, followed by the application tier, which is where the actual um, logic takes place that is needed to perform uh, what needs to be done with the transactions. And then the third tier, the underlying tier being the data tier, so where the data is actually stored and communicated via, via the database server. With transactional systems, so, and this is in contrast to analytical systems. Uh, transactional systems are the systems that are have to be operational. These are the ones that perform the day-to-day -day operations of an organization. So you can think about that self-checkout system as an example of a transactional system that should be up and running and available to customers as they're going through the store. So it should be as close to 100% as possible, detailed down to the individual transaction. So for example, when a person scans an item that it should be able to process all the data from that item. It should be updatable. 
uh, process transactions quickly. You know, you don't want to be standing there waiting, although I've had that experience myself at the store, quite frankly. I don't know. I think Walmart systems are a little bit less invasive than the systems at Juul, for example. It should store current information and archive older data that's not needed for day-to-day -day operations. So that type of data is going to be probably more useful offline in an analytical setting. It's going to support the organization's business functions, so again, day-to-day -day operations, and require concurrency management to deal with users who try to access data at the same time. You can think about all those different self-checkouts working at the same time, that there have to be controls that make sure that you don't get in a condition where it's confusing as to how many items are actually being purchased at the same time. So it should support business processes, again, like a purchase, uh, process small uniform transactions, so again, like scanning an item, be optimized for quick writing and storage. So you have that operational database that's taking care of, you know, which customers are purchasing which items at which location very quickly and the data should be functionally oriented. So the note here is that when a person wants to actually analyze data from a transaction processing system, the first thing they should do is take it offline because you obviously don't want to mess up any of the data that's stored on the operational database that's supporting the transaction processing system. That could be very dangerous and cause problems for the organization. So in your case as an individual doing data analysis, maybe from a data set that you've downloaded from Kaggle or from the census, you should always first make a copy so that you can treat it as an analytical data set, one that you're able to mess with and devote to a specific type of analysis and that you have that original copy, that snapshot uh, that you can keep safe in case you wanna do a different analysis or if you just wanna revert back to what you started with. Another example of a transactional system is an enterprise resource planning system or ERP. So ERP systems are designed to take in data from every functional area in an organization. So everything from customer service to inventory so that there are no information silos within the organization that everybody is given access to uh, the same information that maintains its integrity so that everybody in the business, regardless of what function they perform, is working with appropriate data. Other benefits of having an enterprise resource planning system are that once transactional data comes in, it only has to be entered once and can then be shared across functional areas. Um, if you have changes to the master data set, they're uh, only entered once and can be used many times. So you'll see an example of that when you're working with Eclipse in this course. Um, and the data processing and storage functionality of all the business processes across functional areas are consolidated in a single system, and this reduces the costs of the information technology required to keep the business functions uh, working. So not every business uses an ERP. Some businesses are either just very small and they don't need to integrate data across functional areas. It may just be a couple of people taking care of customer service and inventory, et cetera. Um, and functionally oriented systems such as point of sale or computer aided design will usually remain unintegrated. So for example, if you're getting some specialized work done, somebody's designing something special for you, that data won't need to be a part of, say, the transaction when you actually pay for that item. So informational systems, or as I called them, analytical systems, are in contrast to the transaction processing systems. So you can think about online analytical processing or OLAP systems. These are systems that users will access in order to make data-driven decisions. So these types of systems are not responsible for day-to-day -day operations, but provide a place for data to be stored and prepared for analytical purposes. This is kind of the stop, like I said, before making sure that you're not going to interfere with data as it's serving day-to-day -day operations. Uh, these systems can be historical and hold large volumes of previous data. So again, trying to get insights about what's happened in order to make predictions and uh, get data-driven insights so that strategic decisions can be made. This data may also be aggregated, so kind of pulled up to a higher level. So 
as opposed to having every individual transaction of when a person bought, say, some cheese from Jewel. You've got just ag an aggregation of the volume of cheese that was purchased maybe in a specific location or even a region, so depending upon what level it's aggregated. But it will usually have come from that transaction processing system originally. A good example of this is a data warehouse, which these are kind of falling out of fashion, but they, they do exist to hold all this kind of historical data. Informational or analytical systems are much less detailed than transactional systems. Again, this is because they have so much data. So you're going to see aggregations or summary. Um, data are going to be uh, extracted from other systems and then loaded into the system periodically. So basically, it's not going to be updated necessarily at all times. It may be updated, say, every week, every day. It just depends on how uh, often the organization feels that it is necessary to keep it up to date, at what level they feel like they can get insights uh, from those updates. These types of systems need to be designed to handle a variety of queries and ad hoc reporting. So ad hoc just meaning that we might not know the kinds of questions that we have about a data set until we see it. So we want to be able to write whatever kind of query that we want to once we see the data and then go from there. These systems support decision making at the managerial and even strategic level. So again, because you're looking at aggregates and running with that from there, you're not going to, again, be looking at every single transaction that happened on a point of sale system. They're going to be optimized for quick reading so that you can do a quick analysis. Again, it's going to be historical data, data that may be integrated from a multitude of sources, and then it will be available to users based on their uh, permissions. So usually at a large organization, only specific users will have access to higher levels of the data. We can also get data from legacy systems. So these are going to be traditionally older technologies that aren't used anymore. These were sometimes developed internally. So many organizations still have these legacy systems and just don't feel the need to update them. Once they've run their course, they may shut them down or they may just have somebody maintaining them because there's nothing they can do in terms of updating them or integrating them in with the rest of the systems that they currently have. We can also get data from web services. So there are ways to um, connect using different protocols like the simple object access protocol. You can pull XML data straight off the page uh, and actually download that information that whatever's on that web page to then parse and get the information that you need. I actually did this, like I said, manually uh, by just kind of going to the website, looking at the um, HTML in the background and other markup, and then throwing that into a text file and going from there. Another popular method, which some websites are taking action against crawlers and information agents, but there are uh, there's software that allows you to start at a particular website and then kind of scrape all of uh, the different websites as affiliated with it. So the process of visiting each site is what's called crawling. And then the process of getting the data off the site into a text form or otherwise is what's called scraping. You may have also heard the term spidering. That's similar to crawling as well. Another very popular and up and coming source of data, although I'm sure this has been going on for years now, is that of social media. And you can bet that the social media companies are mainly interested in the types of things that you click on, uh, as well as the type of text that you associate with different things on those sites. So um, don't be you know, alarmed that that's what's happening. That is certainly what's happening. So they want to know what people are interested in so that they can market to them. It's really about advertising and monetizing off of people's behavior on these sites. When I was teaching in 2017, I uh, had students in a Python class that I was teaching use the Twitter API in order to get data directly off Twitter. Uh, and as it turned out, when I tried to do this the following year, you may remember that Mark Zuckerberg went to Congress and sat on his little uh, booster seat and spoke to them about privacy, and probably many of them didn't understand what was going on. At any rate, after that visit, 
many of the APIs for the major social networking sites kind of limited what you could do. And so every assignment I had created was kind of just thrown out the window. We were, we were not able to do that. You now, for Twitter, you have to get a developer account and go through kind of a process in order to get access to that data. So that's one thing to keep in mind that social media companies certainly know the value of the data that they're holding on to. They also greatly understand that the people that use them are now getting more concerned with privacy. And so they're locking things down and making things more difficult to access. Although you can still find um, offline data or request that data or pay for that data even if you want to do some kind of analysis. News sites will also track their text and clicks and store that. So you may be able to get access to that as well to learn more about user behavior. Similarly, e-commerce sites, you know, like Amazon will also analyze text and clicks as well. They will also perform what is called clickstream analysis, which involves the analysis of what people click on and in what order. So um, you can use this information to figure out how to present things to a user to ensure uh, that they click through so that they actually make a purchase, that they go further down into the website and uh, don't click off of it before making a purchase or getting more involved. Another interesting source of data is that of sensors. Sensors are very popular in healthcare, especially. You can even consider the health sensors that you have on your own devices. So for example, tracking your steps, but um, equipment also comes with sensors. So you have uh, from heating units, vehicles, etc., that uh, you can get data from about maintenance alerts, about safety, input and output measurements, um, predictions of failure, that's important in operations management, uh, meter reading for billing and for other purposes. So this is one of the applications of what's called the Internet of Things, kind of getting things to communicate to one another and then having humans be able to read that information to make decisions based on it. And uh, that can also include diagnosis and repair of different types of systems that come with different types of equipment. Like I said, health monitoring sensor sensors are also very important and very popular way of getting data. You may not even realize that you're providing health related data to your phone um, provider, but you may be, so you might wanna look into that. There are also sensors, if you look at Google Maps now, it's become quite sophisticated. We have data on uh, traffic, so where there's actually slowdowns. I remember back when this was not the case, um, where vehicles are, you know, where there are speed traps, things like that. Researchers also use sensors in science and engineering. So for example, if they want to track uh, migration patterns in certain birds or other animals, they can use sensors to do that. And of course, we also have sensors used by NASA and satellites to measure data related to the Earth. So how can we gather data? Well, this is something you're going to be doing in this course, sometimes the data will be given to you. Sometimes you will be asked to gather the data. So what is sampling? Well, you may have heard this term, especially if you've taken a statistics class. Basically, uh, when you consider the data of human beings or um, the data of everyone who could be involved with that data, you consider what's called a population. And so because it's not feasible to get data from every single person on the globe, uh, what we have to do is what's called sampling. So we extract some of the data uh, from the source. In other words, we sample a set of people with the hope that they are representative of a population. Um, and it's appropriate when one or more of the following conditions exist. So like I said, the, that the analysts are certain that each data point is representative of the entire set. So we do this in research all the time, that the source data set is too large for planned analysis. So in other words, you can't talk to every single person on the earth, so it's appropriate to sample. And if the application specifically calls for a data sample, so in some cases, it's not about talking to everyone and sampling, it is just about getting data from a specific source. So for example, with some accounting and regulatory compliance audits. Sometimes you have to calibrate data, so you may have to scale it down. Um, for example, when I was working my dissertation, um, we were trying to create a measure for perceived exertion of a uh, specific incline grade. So the question was, you know, how 
steep does something feel to a person when they're riding it on their bike. We had to kind of assign values and calibrate them, scale them based on the information that we had, based on the different kinds of charts that we showed them related to routes. Sometimes you may even want to standardize data to what's called the normal distribution in statistics. This can allow for very specific analysis and make sure that you're not um, getting mistakes or errors because you're not using standardized data. The government um, can use continuous monitoring techniques and embedded audit modules. So especially after the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, uh, we can now automatically uh, collect data frequently to discover unusual values in data. So this is the case certainly with accounting. Um, we also have feedback mechanisms, so logs that are sent and exception reports, again, to detect anomalies. And we also have the use of intelligent control agents. So essentially, these agents can ensure that a system works without human intervention. So to summarize, uh, sometimes data is provisioned to you, sometimes you get it yourself. Uh, you can have structured and unstructured data. So structured data that's easy to read by a computer and unstructured data that needs a little cleaning before it can be processed. There are many different sources to get data from. So again, my advice to you is to make a copy of data once you get it before you start analyzing it. Um, and remember that the difference between a transactional system and an informational system is just that, that a transactional system stores data that is from day-to-day -day operations, versus data stored in an informational system, which can be aggregated at a higher level and is taken offline for the purpose of analysis. Uh, remember that you might not be able to get every single data point you want, so you can sample, it is appropriate. And you can also collect data automatically, depending upon what you're doing. So this has provided an introduction to data acquisition. I think that once you start to actually get data yourself, that you'll now be primed to kind of think more about the process. Uh, keep in mind the specifics of the fields and records as you're looking at structured data and consider the work that it actually took in order to get to that structured process. Thank you, and please let me know if you have any questions.